Hey, what are you drinking right now? Certainly hope it's none of this stuff. Don't be doing that in 1920. Here we go. Welcome back to Most Amazing Top 10. Here are the top 10 historical facts about the Prohibition era you weren't taught in school. <laughs> Number 10, poison. Somebody literally poisoned the water hole this time around. The Prohibition era was a time where there were restrictions placed on the consumption of alcohol, which was done so with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, another Asian, you name it. Anything that has to do with alcohol, no go. This was all banned by the US government from 1920 to 1933. It's a, it's a long time with their twisted T's. Now, of course, this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol, obviously. It was just done so in sneakier ways, right? Come in my basement. I got some, I got some, yeah, drink this. I don't know, whatever. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead of what they were getting before, which, I mean, as I said it, I'm like, this doesn't sound nice, does it? I'm not thirsty saying this out loud. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing is not. Something that the government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. It was, uh, they literally poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. Drinking. Like, that's, yeah. And not just poison in a way where the consumer would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this alone. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. Cut to today, well, more and more things are now legal, so a little different in these 20s. Number nine, the man in the green hat. Congress had their own personal bootlegger. How nice must that have been? He was known as the man in the green hat. His name was George L. Cassidy. This was probably the weirdest job in history. It's, it, it's up there. Cassidy's nine to five was to walk through the halls of Congress, making up to 30 deliveries of illegal booze every single day. All the while, Capitol Police just watched. Yeah, he could come and go at any time. In over five years, he supplied bottles of whiskey, moonshine, scotch, bourbon, gin, you name it. He'd carry all of this in a briefcase. Yeah, so he couldn't have looked more official with his hat and his briefcase. He's going to work. This guy's nine to five, he's busy. His politician friends eventually got him his own room, his own office to work out of in the house office building. In 1925, he was sadly arrested while ferreting six quarts of whiskey to a house member. He had with him that day a light green hat on, and from then on, he's been referred to as the man in the green hat. Yeah, he was busted. He was busted that sad day. Damn. Don't snitch. Somebody definitely snitched on him, eh? They're like green hat. Looks like the Riddler. He's got a Paps blue ribbon in his briefcase. Get him. Number eight, not an experiment. Okay, hopefully this clears some things up a bit here, but President Herbert Hoover, he never referred to prohibition as a noble experiment. That is a, that's misquoted. That's not the case. That would be an odd thing to experiment, but that's what many believe here. See, growing up, many books and articles on prohibition have quoted President Herbert Hoover describing prohibition as a noble experiment, but even Hoover himself had to get in on this game of broken telephone. Clear some things up a bit. That's a bad quote, especially given the lives lost during this time. Everything's got to be not misquoted at all. Hoover himself reminds us, he assures us that he was a supporter of prohibition, but he actually campaigned for it in 1928. Afterwards, he made a statement at the Republican National Convention saying that our country has deliberately undertaken a great social and economic experiment, noble in motive and far-reaching in purpose. That's the quote, end quote, boom. But years later, Hoover said he was misunderstood. He says the phrase, a great social experiment, noble in motive, was distorted into one thing. It was distorted into a noble experiment, which of course was not at all what he said or not at all what it was. So quit spreading those lies, all right? Let's end this 1928 mix up once and for all. A hundred years later, we're like, oh, Sorry. <laughs> Number seven, World War One. When the United States entered World War One in 1917, prohibition hadn't taken off quite yet. It was close, but still a few things to sign. What really turned the tides were experts coming out and arguing that the barley being used to brew beer could actually be made into bread to feed American soldiers. And then from that point on, I mean, it's kind of hard to argue that, right? You're like, well, okay. Fine then. The war actually allowed some individuals to paint America's German brewing industry as a threat. Yeah, that massive industry. They're like, what are these guys doing? Politicians would label Pabst and Miller as treacherous and menacing, saying there's German enemies right here at home. Yeah, German enemies, and they come in six packs. 
Heads up. Number six, not every state. We see this now being a Canadian, at least I see this. We're seeing certain things become legal all of a sudden. And it's weird, especially when just a few hours south from where I am right now, there are thousands and thousands of people being incarcerated for having something that at the same time is legal or decriminalized up here. You know what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying. It's odd, but we saw this happen in prohibition as well. Many governors at the time refused to throw any money towards enforcing or policing the alcohol ban. Maryland, for example. Okay, Maryland never even enacted an enforcement code in the first place and eventually earned a reputation as the most stubbornly anti-prohibition states in the union. It's not bad, it's pretty cool. New York followed and repealed its measures in 1923 and then slowly but surely it all went away. Therefore, cheers. Nice. That first state was like, you know what? No. <laughs> Number five, Al Capone's brother. Oh man, sometimes siblings can be the exact same. My brother and I we're practically the same person. We love all the same things, same hobbies, same parents, weirdly enough. What a coincidence is that? Al Capone and his brother? Not so close, it seems. A little different. I don't know. On, on paper, historically, they went uh, like this. Al Capone's oldest brother was a prohibition enforcement agent. Yeah, take that in. Al built a criminal empire built on illegal liquor in Chicago in the 1920s, and Vincenzo, the eldest of the six Capone brothers, he had changed his name to Richard Joseph Hart to hide his identity, and after working at the circus for a bit, because why not, Vincenzo settled in Homer, Nebraska in 1922, but eventually he became a special officer, and eventually he was assigned to investigate bootlegging. He's like, oh, do I have to? Come on. After he lost his badge on suspicion of theft, Vincenzo reunited with the Capone family in 1940. He met up with Al again in Miami and started to get in on that family cash, finally. Number four, the boring 20s. When we think of the roaring 20s, we think champagne everywhere, funny music, people dancing like this, good times, whatever. It wasn't always like that, all right? This wasn't the great Gatsby, this was the 1920s. And according to a study conducted by Boston University economists in the early 1990s, alcohol consumption actually fell by 70% during the early years of prohibition. The levels jumped significantly in the late 20s, sure, but even so, they remained 30% lower than their pre-prohibition levels for years after the 21st Amendment was passed. So it took some time. It took some time for people to, uh, you know, get used to it again, if I can say that. Number three, still going. So I was talking about how some places, some states, they didn't enforce this experiment while others did. Well, again, even today, some are still on board and some are still in the 1920s, it seems. The other, the, the fun 20s. Some states maintained a ban on alcohol within their own borders. Even today, they still do it. Yeah, not a fun place to go. Kansas and Oklahoma remained dry until 1948 and 1959, and Mississippi remained alcohol free until 1966. That's 33 years after the passing of the 21st Amendment. Like, guy, can we click refresh? There's some, there's some new things going on behind the scenes. I'd love a beverage, please. It's been 33 years. I'm so thirsty. To this day, 10 states still contain counties where alcohol sales are still prohibited. Yeah, go find them and click the no tip option. And be like. Here you go. Cheers. No receipt for me. I'm good. Number two, new wine. Okay, fine. You want to ban alcohol? Well, we'll just make it ourselves. We'll use our own feet and stomp on some grapes. I know you do that at some point, so yeah, I'm onto something here. A great amount of low-key small distilleries and breweries continued to operate in secret during Prohibition. But if you weren't operating in the shadows, you had to either shut your doors or find new uses for these massive factories. For example, Bush, they refitted their breweries to make ice cream. And Coors, they went down the pottery and ceramics route. Yeah, can I get a tall boy of mint chocolate? Nice, thanks. Tip option for sure on that one. Two scoops, of course, of course. Now I want chocolate, damn. And finally, number one, grandpa's medicine. Okay, we'll end on this one. The Volstead Act had a few hidden gems in it, okay? You gotta read very closely. There were some exceptions to the ban on distributing alcohol. Like today, we have medicinal purposes for everything. First, of course, right? The same for alcohol. Oh, alcohol helps my anxiety. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sacramental wine was still permitted for religious purposes, and drugstores were allowed to sell medicinal whiskey to treat toothaches and the flu. So you already know, hundreds of people just randomly showed up, lied about their tooth hurting just to get their drink on. One pint of hard liquor every three days. Plan accordingly. There you go, good luck. Pick one movie and then just go, go for it, I guess. Take three ounces every hour until stimulated. Got it, say no more, doc, thank you. Many speakeasies eventually started to disguise themselves as pharmacies. Meanwhile, actual pharmacies were lost in the dust. Some poor fellow's like, no, my tooth actually hurts, bro. I swear it actually hurts, I'm not like one of those guys. Or am I? 
I'll never tell. Those are the top 10 historical facts about the Prohibition era you weren't taught in school. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and we'll see you next time on Most Amazing Top 10. Spirit fingers. See you later. All right, ba, 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 ba. All right. we're talking about the, the Prohibition era. I don't know how to do a cold intro to that one. Important, <clears throat> I'm just talking all of a sudden today, I'm like Now this event is still one of the strangest and deadliest, <clears throat> deadliest. Number six, no, <laughs> what? That's because I, uh, yeah, that's what the legal, the other legal thing is. Number nine, not a six, upside down. <clears throat> mm -mm -mm. Oh, Starbucks is so good. Please don't ban that. But even Huber himself, Huber, who the f Huber? Uh, oh, sorry, I got lost in the, I was so close to you. I was like, I can do this. Sorry, thank you. During the early years, <laughs> years, what?